Thanks for checking out this Game of Thrones review. This is for Season 8, Episode 5, which is, we've been told, is the second to last episode. So where it left off with, with Episode 4, people were like, here we go, we're going to get into a war, and then it's like, all of a sudden we slowed things down? Like, they were right there, there was tension, and then they just kind of cut away from that, and you're like, what are we doing? We're slowing things down all of a sudden? I don't know. So I've been doing star ratings for these. If um, if you haven't been watching, you should go back and watch my other reviews on the other episodes of season eight. But I've been doing star ratings at the end where I say, you know, out of five stars with half stars in play, this is how many stars I'd give it for a Game of Thrones episode. So I'm just going to tell you my star rating for this one up front. This is a two out of five. Um, not good, in my opinion, especially with the being the second to last episode, not of the season, of the series, of the entire series to wrap things up. And based off of where we left off with episode four, there was a lot more that should have been in this. And I'll go, I'm, I'm obviously going to break down like what I didn't like, but there were a few things I did like, so it's not all bad. So stick with it and we'll talk about this. But two stars for this one. Um, as you can tell, I wasn't very happy with this episode. So we have one more left. Let's see what happens. So I wrote at the top of my paper, because I have my notes here that I took, I wrote at the top of my paper that it had been said that these episodes would be longer. And that's true, because it took, you know, two years for them to do this season, and it was only going to be six episodes. They were like, but these are going to be longer episodes. Now, I believe the first two episodes were not actually all that much longer. They were about an hour. And then after that, they started getting a little bit longer. So yes, overall, these episodes are longer. But there's a lot of padding, in my opinion, a lot of padding where they really slow things down. They put a lot of extra stuff in that doesn't need to be there. It's kind of like they're like, we're going to give you more. But then they're just like, and by give you more, we mean things that should appropriately be left on the cutting room floor as opposed to actually being in the episodes. So it's it's a lot of extra exposition. And um, as I kind of wrote down later on, which I'll pro I might end up bringing up again as I'm talking about this episode, there are a lot of shots, at least in this episode, of people staring. Just a lot of shots of people just staring at other people, staring at things. I was just like, what is going on? Why is there so much staring? And I understand they're trying to do it for like tension or like, oh my gosh, maybe something's about to happen. But when you keep showing people just staring, it's like, okay, A, I think you're just wasting time. B, can we just get on with it? Like, you're not doing anything here. You're not adding to anything. I'm sorry, this is going to be very ranty uh, when I go over this episode. I'm just, I'm a little worked up because we've been promised a lot and I felt like if this episode was like decent, I was going to be like, okay, you know, I can forgive some of the issues, but I don't even think it was all that decent. Like I said, two out of five stars. Like, there's some good things, but overall, like, it didn't give you much. It really didn't give you much. Um, okay, so I had originally written down, like, where's the fight for King's Landing? Like I said, where they left off with episode four, the tension was there, the conflict was there. I was like, we're getting right into it. And if you go back and watch my review for that, I had said, we better be getting like the fight for King's Landing for the last two episodes, pretty much with maybe, you know, a little bit of stuff here or there, but we certainly didn't get that because they cut away and they're setting up other things. I do like some of the other things they set up, but I think they could have set those up a lot earlier in maybe in season four uh, or I'm sorry, season four, episode four, not season four in episode four, they could have set some of those other things up so they didn't have to take as much time. Because it was kind of like a, you you went into this episode kind of like amped up and like ready to go based off where four stopped. And then it's just like, is like pumps the brakes immediately. And you're like, oh, oh, okay. We're going to, we're going to slow like way down. Okay. But in all fairness, they did pick it up a little bit later, but I think it was like maybe 20 minutes or so into the episode. So I don't know. Um, so you see, I mean, obviously one of the big, big, big things that happens during this episode, other than, you know, the f actual fighting at King's Landing, which eventually happens, is the fact that Varys has turned on Daenerys and Tyrion decides, hey man, 
I don't know if my conscience will allow me to, even though we are friends, just allow you to go behind Daenerys back and try and get Jon Snow, Rhaegar Targaryen, in the throne instead of her. Um, so that obviously, if you're watching this, you should have watched the show because obviously, huge spoilers. Um, that leads us to where Varys gets killed. And for me, that's actually one of the most impactful deaths in the series because Varys was one of my favorites. And the other thing is, if you think about it, Varys was kind of where all of this begun. Uh, because he's the one who made sure that Daenerys stayed alive. And he's the one that actually set a lot of things in motion for Daenerys to get going, for her to get the, her rebellion moving, for her to, you know, build up a lot of her troops and everything. So, like, everything starts with Varys. And because of his intelligence, because of his drive to get a terrible ruler out of um, Westeros. See, my cat, you hear her yelling? She hated the episode too. But because because they, he wanted to get him out, he was so focused. He was using his intelligence and he was um, trying to do the right thing, really. You know, he's playing the long game, but he's trying to do the right thing. So for, for that reason, when Daenerys just kills him, it's kind of this moment of like, really? You couldn't like cut this guy some slack because of everything he's done for you, because without him, you would be dead, most likely. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, cut him some slack, maybe. Or just, just one time. But this goes along with what we've been seeing in the last two episodes, where Daenerys is obviously becoming a lot less of the good person that she has been for much of the series, and becoming more of an authoritarian uh, figure, someone who is very much driven by just her ambition at this point, uh, as we all know, know that now, watching this episode where she, um, there was a plea by Tyrion to not kill innocent people with dragon fire, and she was just like, yeah, we're just gonna burn the streets, just kill them all, whatever, and obviously you can see at that point she's basically turned into the Mad Queen, if you will, because, you know, all the references to the Targaryen Mad King, she is now basically the Mad Queen, she's unhinged, and she's unhinged because of her paranoia because she thinks people are going to knock her off the throne even before she gets there which you know is legitimate but like I said in my review of the last episode when you start a movement that is for the people and is for making things better if you are no longer the best choice you need to realize that and step aside you can start a movement but it doesn't stay yours if it's for the people and the problem is she started a movement for the people as she said she it became more about her because a better option showed up and she didn't want to step aside because she now wants the power she no longer believes in doing it for the people she believes in doing it for herself because of all the sacrifices she had to make because of all the hard work she put in she feels like i need this payoff now but that's no longer what's best for the people so this is why we end up in this problem um do 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 and here's a question when when Tyrion went to uh, talk to Daenerys and let her know that he found out that Varys was, you know, plotting behind her back. Was it me, or when they showed her face up uh, up close, did they intentionally, with, like, makeup and stuff, make her look a bit haggard? I feel like they did, and I feel like it was for the reason of she's been through a lot, The the she's probably not sleeping because of how kind of paranoid she is that people are doing things behind her back. And she is worried about the possibility of her not making it to the throne, even though she's gone through so much. So you can answer that question down in the comments. Did you feel that way? Did you? I did. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. So if you notice during the execution of Varys, Jon Snow has like the way he reacts, like go back and watch it and watch the way he reacts it feels to me like this is the first actual moment that there's an a facial recognition and a physical recognition that he has some sort of doubt in her. Like, I be, feel like the burning of Varys is that one moment that starts the crack in the foundation of Jon Snow's support for Daenerys. And obviously, as we go on with this episode, as soon as she starts just burning King's Landing after you know, the, the surrender bells had been rung, That's it, that furthers it even more. There are even much bigger cracks. But we'll really have to see how large those cracks in the foundation are come next episode, which is the last episode, supposedly. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I had written down, you know, this is an authoritarian ruler. Like, she's officially po- p- p- yeah, officially crossed into authoritarian rule personality. She's paranoid. She's willing to do anything to win. And that means sacrificing the lives of others without thought, really. She used to take a lot of consideration in past seasons with, you know, people could lose their lives because of this. And it seems like in this season, she's much more decisive and doesn't really think about it much. She's just like, you know, this is what we got to do. We got to get there. And I think part of that is that she's so close to the Iron Throne now. She's so close that she's like, we can't let anything stand in the way at this point. And then also, she even says it in this episode, the fact that Cersei will use my um, mercy as a weakness and exploit that. And I think that's also part of what ends up happening where, uh, you know, the surrender bells ring and then she, like, hesitates for a bit and then she's like, I'm going to burn this thing down. I think it's because it's possible she believes that the bell ringing is actually a ploy. And, in fact, there isn't a surrender because, you know, as we know from what, how Cersei is, you know, there have been plenty of times where she said, oh, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And then she does the total opposite because she's a disgusting human being whose word means nothing. And she will. She is also an authoritarian type who will do anything to win at all costs. So, yeah. So a little bit understandable, I guess. But burning innocent people, I don't know about that. Um, I did find it a little bit interesting how they kind of set up multiple paths to get rid of Cersei at the beginning of this episode. But once again, I feel like they maybe could have set that up a little bit during the last episode. Uh, obviously, the one where Tyrion lets Jamie go. Because he's like, you promised to talk to Cersei, you promised to get her out of there. Basically saying, like, appeal to her, get her to love you again, and then you guys abscond with each other to a undisclosed place and start a life together. And you don't have to be a part of this. And everyone wins because she's gone, and you guys get to live together and, you know, keep having incestual sex. Go for it. Um, But here's the thing with that. Again and again and again, Tyrion's like, we can appeal to Cersei. Cersei's going to listen. And this is another instance where you see him talking to Jamie about this and you're just like, have you learned nothing yet? Like his idiocy, like he's super, super smart, but it seems like when it comes to this one thing, he's such an idiot. And that doesn't really make sense with his character that he hasn't learned this yet. Yes, I think part of it has to do with the fact that he just wants to let Jamie go because he actually cares about him. And he has this really nice kind of monologue to him about, you know, you were the only person who ever treated me as a normal person, who didn't treat me as a monster when I was growing up and even now. And it, it was a nice, like, emotional moment. So I think that does play into a lot of it. But do you, like, can Tyrion really think that he would be able to talk Cersei into it? Nobody can talk her into anything, anything. And that's been well established. And he should know that at this point. So, I don't know. Um, Then there was the aspect of, you know, Arya and the Hound going into King's Landing because Arya wants to kill Cersei. So, there's your second option. And then, obviously, the third most present option is the actual war going on. And they are able to storm all the way to the castle and, you know, take her out. So, I did kind of like that they had three different options, three paths right there. And it's kind of like a race to see which path can get there first. So I did like that kind of setup. But a lot of the other stuff in this episode just kind of drove me nuts, which we're getting to. Um, But I did kind of question, I was like, how did Arya, the Hound, and Jaime all get in? You know what I mean? Like, I understand, like, you see the part where they're kind of like rushing through the crowd to get into, like, the inner portion of King's Landing. But how did they even get into the outer portion of King's Landing? Because I would assume they would have had a lot of guards out there since they're on the, like, like, right on the precipice of war. So they wouldn't just let anyone just kind of wander into King's Landing, whether it's on the inner wall or the outer wall. I'm just saying it doesn't really make sense from a story standpoint. It doesn't make sense at all. Okay, so then jumping to where, like, the actual fight started with Daenerys riding the dragon and breathing fire over Euron's ships, the Iron Fleet, and just destroying them. I watched it and I was just like, like, the the fire was being breathed and then the ships were, like, exploding. And I was like, I'm not sure that the dragon's fire would actually make the ships explode. I understand that, like, the force of it would, like, knock some things off, but it kind of seemed like where it hit 
instead of like taking things further from that path you know what i mean like if the fire came down and here's like here's like the ship if the fire comes down and it hits the ship it would kind of you know bear it down into the water but it kind of seemed like more it kind of hits it and then everything exploded outward which didn't really make sense physics wise to me so i was like you know it's a little gripe from me but i was kind of like those wouldn't explode like that this is kind of crazy but also i will point out with like when it when the dragon was going after the ballasts on the the tops of the walls when he would hit the walls the walls were reacting properly as they were mainly just like toppling over which makes sense because the force of the fire would just like topple things so i don't know it was just weird that the that the ships literally were like Michael Bay explosions. I was like, what? Come on, man. Um, and then the other thing I wrote is there's no gunpowder on those ships. So I could see it if like there were guns in this world and there was gunpowder on the ships and that would make it explode. That makes sense. But there's no gunpowder. There is no gunpowder. Um, so then the question arises as this dragon and Daenerys are just like wreaking havoc, taking everyone and everything out with the ships, with all this ballast, with the wall. It seems easy, just effortless. So how, just a episode ago, I believe it was in episode four, how was it so simple for them to take these ballast arrows and just shoot down one of the other dragons? It doesn't make sense. That's the point. It makes absolutely no sense like i had said during that episode review they shoot that dragon with three of those giant arrows in pretty quick succession like dead on first of all how do you do that second of all if it's that easy for them then how is it not that easy for them now when they're not only using more ships to shoot these arrows from but also all the ballasts that were set up on the walls of king's landing so you have way more flying at it. You would think that dragon would definitely go down. So it's this issue of like things happen when they just want them to, but they don't happen when they don't want them to. It's uh, it's convenience over logic is what it ends up being, which sometimes it's fine. You can kind of just suspend your belief on that type of stuff and it's okay. But the issue is I feel like Game of Thrones has been really good about not falling into those issues so that when something like this happens, you're kind of like, oh, it's it's way more jarring. You're just like, oh, how did they let that get by? Like, what's going on? So I don't know. Maybe for a lot of you, it's kind of like a small thing. You can let me know. Comments once again. Um, yeah, then I put way annoying. Just so many shots of people just staring. Unbelievable. I hated it. It just seemed like, how do we waste more time? Oh, we, we told them we would give them longer episodes. Let's put in some more shots of people staring at stuff and staring at other people. I'm like, get out of here with that crap. Um, then I got really mad because I was like, that moment where Jon Snow and uh, and all the troops were in King's Landing and they come up against like the King's Guard, or I think they call them like the Golden Guard or something like that, or the Golden Army, um, and they just like end up laying their swords down. I was like, cop out. This is such a cop-out because you don't want to do, like, the big fight scene. You do then eventually end up getting more of a fight scene, but not to the level that most people wanted, I assume. And once again, you can let me know down in the comments, you know, did it meet your expectation on that? Or did it fall short, like, for me? Because I felt like there wasn't nearly as much fighting as there should have been, especially with the fact that this took two years to get this season out. I'm just saying... Like, you think back to, to, like, the great moments in Game of Thrones, and, like, the Battle of the Blackwater was phenomenal. Now, this fight of King's Landing should have been just as good or better, and it fall it falls way short. So the fact that when you were doing one season per year, and you did way better than when you took two years to put it together, seems ridiculous to me. Just saying. Once again, maybe I'm alone on this. Comments, comments, people. Um, so, ooh, doo, 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 doo. yeah, I wrote down that maybe Daenerys thought the surrender was a ploy. I think that could be totally legitimate, but she's also kind of off a rocker. She's kind of nuts. She's power hungry, whatever. She's like, I'm down to kill people now. Um, then, <laughs> this is another small thing, but another, like, logical small thing. Grey Worm, when he's fighting, and he's fighting in the streets, and it's a very cluttered, like, crowded fight, 
you're not surviving that fight with a spear. Like, he's going through, and he's just wrecking house with this long spear. And I'm just like, there's no way you don't get killed if your only weapon is a spear, and there's that many people there swinging swords around you. It's asinine. It's totally asinine. You need to have a certain amount of distance in order to nail people with that spear, and people would be right up on you. You could be overwhelmed so quick. So there, it just makes no sense. He should have traded a spear in for a sword, and it would make more sense. I'm sorry. Um, oh, the other thing is, like, it. I mean, it didn't, it didn't make sense with the uh, all the soldiers, like Jon Snow's soldiers coming in and focusing on the, the villagers. I guess it, it made sense from the story perspective of, like, that's an extension of of Daenerys because it's her people and it's an extension of the issue of her kind of becoming out of control. So they're showing that the soldiers are also becoming kind of out of control because she's becoming out of control and just killing people. So they're like, Oh, I guess this really doesn't matter. But to me, it kind of seemed like they have their goal. They need to take out all the, the military types, the actual like guards, soldiers, and there's still a bunch of soldiers alive, so why would these people then, like, stray off and be like, I'm just going to kill defenseless people? But, I mean, you also do end up with issues where you just have crappy people. Uh, which leads me to that moment where Jon Snow um, kills that one guy, that one soldier, under his uh, direction. Because he was, it looked like he was going to rape a woman. So good on Jon Snow for saving her. <laughs> but then not on good, not on, not good on Jon Snow for being like, captain obvious and very unhelpful after the fact when he looks at her and is just like you need to find a place to hide duh don't you think that's what she was doing when she was grabbed and assaulted don't you think that's what she was doing it, it's kind of like a really stupid moment of dialogue like an awful line of dialogue to be honest it would have been way more impactful if nothing was said and he just kind of like killed him Took a took like a second for him to have like a facial reaction to the fact that he just killed one of his own soldiers. Look at the lady, realize that he did something good, and then go back to the to the battle. That would have been more impactful, in my opinion. Just like find somewhere to hide was just like, duh. Um, then I started questioning. I'm like, well, all this is going on, and things are clearly going very very wrong for Cersei and King's Landing. What are what are they doing with that wildfire? You know what I mean? Because, like, as things start are exploding because of the fire, you see green explosions in King's Landing, and that's the wildfire, like, caches of the wildfire exploding. Why was that not being used? Like, especially if you're going to include it in the episode in any capacity, why was it not used? It makes no sense. Like... I understand, like, just gloss over it. Like, act like it's not even there if you're not going to use it. But if you're going to show it, use it. Like, 100% use it. Because you're literally pointing out the flaw in your own show if you're showing it and not using it. It's ridiculous. Because I know they're using these ballasts to go after the dragon. But doesn't it make sense to just, like, chuck wildfire at the dragon? Especially when it comes down and swoops down and tries to get close to the ballasts to, to burn them down? Just throw some wildfire. It'll burn right through that sucker. I mean, throw wildfire on the army that's coming at you. Literally, like, they have to bust into the gates. And you have people who can be on the tops of the uh, of the castle. My cat's right here. She'll probably show up. Um, uh, you have to be on the top of the castle. You can just dump it down on people. Like, there's so many uses here. It's so many uses. They missed a lot of opportunities. I'm telling you, they missed a lot of opportunities on this. Um, now cutting to uh, Euron. Uh, the fight between Jamie and Euron was pretty cool. I did enjoy that. That was that was a relatively good time, especially because Euron dies. And uh, everyone was happy about that, I am sure, especially Cersei when she would find out because, ew, like she had sex with that dude. Well, she had sex with her brother, too, so I guess that's also ew. But um, but that guy is just, like, a horrible human being and disgusting, and no one could stand him. So even Cersei was happy that he got killed, I am sure. So it was this nice kind of satisfying moment of people like, he's dead, good, hated that guy. 
And that, you know, that's the type of character he was built to be. Just terrible. Just, you were supposed to hate that guy. So that when this moment happened, you're like, right on, we're there with you. Um, I thought the, the talk between Arya and the Hound was, um, like, it made sense of, like, you don't want to become me if you're just going for revenge. Like, this is who I've become and this is a problem. Uh, like, I get that. But th I feel like that talk makes sense much earlier like before they get to the point where buildings are falling down around them and they're embroiled in this fight um you know like it just didn't seem like the time for this discussion it's fine the discussion happened but have it at a different time you know what i mean like it, it made it probably made more sense if it happened before they even got into king's landing because especially because how long were they traveling together and it was known to the hound that Arya's uh, goal was to kill Cersei. So when they're about to go to her, why is it then that it just dawns on him, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't do this. It, it just doesn't seem right, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> I laughed when uh, Kaiben got killed. I, I was sitting there watching the show by myself, and I laughed out loud when Kaiben got killed because, screw that guy. Like, he was just, like, awful. Just a terrible person. It, it kind of went with the Euron thing, you know? He was, he was like, a more reserved, awful person. He's those people who, like, talk condescendingly to everyone and is just like, oh, I'm such a good, nice, polite person, but really I'm a total piece of garbage. So when he, in the way that he got killed by his own zombie creation, basically, the mountain, um, I viewed it kind of like as a Victor Frankenstein being killed by Frankenstein's monster. You know, that which you created has destroyed you. So it was very much that situation. And it was funny and it was good. I did enjoy that. And then we get the fight between the Hound and the Mountain, which a lot of people have been wanting for many seasons. I know this. Uh, me too. I, I definitely wanted it. And that fight was actually a pretty good fight. I was pretty satisfied with that, especially the end of that fight where, uh, fittingly, the Hound kills himself in order to take his brother with him. I really liked that moment. I thought it was very appropriate, especially for who the Hound ha has become throughout the series. So I really did like that that moment. It was good. The fight was really good, and then the way it resolved was really good. I'm down. Although, I guess we don't know for sure if either of them are actually dead. You would assume so, but you can't know for sure. Then it dawned on me when, when that was happening. So if Kaiben ha has all along had the ability to resurrect people and basically make zombie soldiers like he did with the mountain. Why was he not creating a zombie soldier army for Cersei? Why? Like there's another thing. It's just like the dragon's fire or the wildfire. You have the wildfire. You should use it. You have the ability to make zombie soldiers who are way harder to kill. As we saw in the fight between the hound and the mountain. Why were you not creating more zombie soldiers? Just another thing, another missed opportunity. A lot of missed opportunities here, to be honest. Um, side note, though, real quick. The guy who plays the mountain, I forget his name, but I recently saw a mini documentary about him on ESPN, actually, because he, the guy is like a strongman competition competitor, and they found him in Iceland, uh, and, and then they cast him for um, the mountain in, in Game of Thrones. That guy eats eight meals a day. I saw in the documentary, and I was like, that's crazy. Could you imagine eating eight meals a day? And he said, he's just like, I don't eat because I'm hungry. I eat because I have to because of my training. And I was like, that would suck because you're, like, taking the joy out of eating at that point. But imagine trying to factor in eight meals each day into your day. That's a lot of time taken up. Anyway, sorry for that side tangent, but um, he did a good job as the mountain. He really did. He was just a massive dude. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, the whole thing about the zombies. Um, so one of my issue, one of my biggest issues is with this show, especially with this episode, the second to last episode, especially where we were left at the end of episode four, show me a good fight or show me story. Which in the beginning, it was slow, but they showed me story before they got to the fight. I felt like they had a lot of moments during, during the fight where they just showed people running from things, people running in general, and gratuitous amounts of buildings falling down. And it's like, 
if we're doing this right now, if we're wrapping up this series, show me the fight or show me story. Stop wasting my time with people just endlessly running and buildings endlessly falling down. It's gratuitous. It seems like you're padding it and you're wasting my time. You're wasting everyone's time, really. It just, it made this episode seem so long and drawn out and kind of pointless, even though there is a point. The problem is when you draw things out like this and you slow it down so much and make like gratuitous staring, gratuitous buildings falling down, gratuitous people running, people hate that. It makes it seem like nothing's happening, even though things are happening. It drove me nuts, man. If you can't tell, I'm sure you can. Um, and then, and then I actually wrote down like, at this point, no one really cared about the scene with Jamie and, and Cersei in, in the kind of like the crypts of, um, of King's Landing, like their emotional stuff and Cersei being like, Oh God, I want my child to live. We should live together. All that kind of stuff. The problem is like, I understand why you have that scene in there because it's her going through it, but you have to understand your viewers don't care. And they don't care about the emotional pleas of Cersei because there's no sympathy left. Like, at this point, if any viewer has sympathy left for Cersei, what is wrong with you? Like, she literally has done the worst thing in every scenario. She's always chosen the worst road to go down in every scenario. So for her to finally make, like, this emotional plea, it's very hollow. And it just doesn't work, to be honest. Sorry, got to flip the page. I only have a few more things, and then I'm wrapped up. I know it's past a half an hour at this point, so sorry, but I had a lot to say. So, where are we right now? Um, oh, real quick. Uh, what's with Arya and the horse at the end, and why are we wrapping up the episode this way? Like, I, I can understand if the end of it is, okay, Arya's okay now. Now she's going off somewhere, but show where she's going at least. I guess maybe they have it as like, oh, you don't know where she's going. Is she actually taking the Hound's advice and she's going to go, you know, go somewhere else? Or is she going to go after Cersei, who is potentially crushed by rocks? We don't know. Um, but the whole, like, scene with her finding this horse is just, it's weird and it's dumb. And you're just like, yeah, this is, this is how we're going to end this. This is how we're doing this right now. Because the other thing is, like, she gets up. She's looking around. Everyone's dead. Everyone's burned. Everything's destroyed. But yet, there's this white horse almost completely unblemished. Are we supposed to believe this is like the Lord of Light intervening or something? Some sort of divine something? Did Bran do this? I don't know. Where is Bran, by the way? What's going on with him? Is he going to show up in the last episode? I don't know. It was a terrible scene. I gotta be honest, it was awful. It seemed to me like, what? Why are we doing this? And the other thing is, it was excessively long. Once again, another issue. The theme of this episode was excessively drawn out, excessively long, gratuitously long shots of things that don't matter worth a crap. And it's infuriating. So... All that said, where are we now? Where we are now, especially if Cersei's dead, is Daenerys is the villain. Because she's off her, off her rocker. She's become unhinged. She killed a bunch of people. She's obviously now been cast as a bad person because of what she's done. And it sets us up for the fight between Jon and um, Jon, a.k.a. Rhaegar, and Daenerys. That's where we go. I mean, uh, hopefully it's a very large fight uh, and this last episode redeems everything, which is possible, you know. It could be really good. It could go, could go out with an awesome fight and really awesome story. That's what we're all hoping for. What I really want to see is a really tough division amongst all the troops who remain under Daenerys of people going and, and going for uh, Jon Snow and then people staying with Daenerys and having to fight each other and the issue of, you know, we were just basically like family in a sense fighting together and now we're fighting each other. That's what I want to see. That's the good story right there and the fighting better be good and you better 
get rid of all the staring, get rid of all the buildings falling down, and all the running. <sighs> Jesus. This was a frustrating episode to watch, to be honest. Um, this is, in my opinion, one of the worst episodes I've seen of Game of Thrones. I mean, certainly the worst of this season. That's bad. That's why I gave it two stars. Like I said, there were still some good things. And it sets it and it sets us up so that things can be great in the last episode. So let's all hope for a great in the last episode. Anyway, uh, I've rambled on long enough for this. Uh, thank you, everyone, for checking this out. Go ahead and put your comments down here about your feelings. You know, maybe you feel like I'm totally off base, and that's fine. Go ahead and put that down there. Tell me. I loved it, and this is why. Just justify it. Don't just say you're wrong and leave it at that. But uh, give me some justification, and we can go back and forth. We can have a dialogue. You know, maybe you can change my mind. I don't know. Um, maybe there's some stuff in there that I didn't consider or didn't really see. Let me know. Hit that subscribe, though, if you liked anything or if you like any of my videos. Hitting the subscribe takes you like a second. It can mean a lot for me, and it's painless for you, totally painless. You can hit the notification bell so you know every time that uh, one of my videos goes up, which is helpful. And then, obviously, you can do thumbs-ups if you want and the comments. But anyway, thank you, everyone, for checking this out. Hopefully, we get what we want next episode. But if we don't, I feel like there's going to be a lot of HBO rage quitters. <laughs> And maybe people who wouldn't come back for the, uh, like, spinoff series they're going to have. I think they're doing, like, a few of them, actually. So, I mean, if this series doesn't end the way people like it, I can see people not coming back for the spinoffs. But we'll find out. Anyways, until next time, keep it brutal.